If you find the Berlin Endgame boring, then you have come to the right place. Or let's say if you're watching some live Grandmaster tournament, or maybe you're you're catching a replay of it, and the Grandmasters decide to play the Berlin Endgame, D4, Knight D6, take, 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 Knight F5. And for around this point in the game, you just have no idea why they're playing the moves they're playing, or what White should really be trying to do in this sort of position. Well, then you have also come to the right place. Hello, my dear chess friends, fellow adult improvers. I'm Grandmaster Max Illingworth, and in this training, we are going to make the Berlin Endgame fun again. Now, before I share with you how White actually wins from these sort of positions, of course, being a when he wins chess games, of course, we understand that if Black plays correctly, he will, of course, hold a draw. But let's basically do a little bit of a mindset shift, because... Even many of the world's top players, you know, you say Berlin Endgame, they go, oh, I hate the Berlin Endgame, oh, just so boring, there's nothing really going on, like, how do I break Black's Fortress even? Uh, however, the thing is that when we say that something is boring, what it actually means normally, and it's something I picked up from Alex Malinsky in a, a chat like 15 or 20 years ago now, if we find something boring, it just means that we don't really understand it. So let's work on actually understanding what it is we're trying to do in the Berlin. And I've prepared six really nice games. You're going to really love these games. And they're going to cover the following themes. If you do have a, a pen and paper, you might want to write this one down. You could also write these in the comments below, which of these points is sort of a big one for you. So that way you can kind of help each other to improve, as it were. Make it a little bit more interactive. But basically, we're going to discover ideas such as White using his lead in development with the e6 break because if you think about it one problem of black sub is that his king is stuck in the center in a lot of cases especially in the lines where he puts the king on e8 and in that case if we're able to open up the position for our lean in development even without the queens on the board this can still give us a quite strong initiative by the way if you are enjoying this video do make sure to leave a like and also to consider subscribing actually right now we're pretty close to hitting the 3,000 required watch hours on my channel to allow me to actually monetize the channel. And while perhaps my motivation to channel you are more about just helping you guys as much as possible more than like how much mic I make out of it, you know, every little bit helps. So if you do make sure watch a train 10, just want you to know that it's something that I you know really very much appreciate that you, you know, find my training valuable as it were. Uh, but let's also understand what Black is trying to do because Black obviously has some trump cards as well here. And especially what helps Black a lot is the fact that he has, I wouldn't even say the bishop pair, even though it's technically true, but especially that light squared bishop. And it's kind of fortress or blockade of sorts that Black has over the light squares. It really does help his case quite a lot. Because if it was just a pawn end game, you know, we just push our king side pawns forward and, you know, we just win with what's effectively an extra pawn. Because, you know, these guys over here on the queen side are not going to so easily turn into a pass so without a, a little bit of help from white let's say but yeah this is why this is such a reliable system for black because it's not so easy for us to effectively advance our king side pawns you know that might be level a okay if we get a pass pawn on the king side it's great but there's a little bit of nuance in how we should go about it and in the second game i'll show you like how black can leverage that light squared play where you know light squares can end up quite weak if we uh if we're not a little bit careful the third game I will share with you a type of endgame that can arise from here, where if you do get the same colored bishop endgame, how you kind of win and how you convert that extra pawn into a win on the king's side. Um, it's maybe not an exact position you'll get that much in your games, but it'll really, I think, help your understanding quite a lot. The fourth game will actually show Carlsen losing with black, where Caruana beat Carlsen in a very nice game where you just really played against the black light squared bishop just make it very hard for that bishop to kind of get active and to free black's position. Um, the fifth game between Shanklin and So is actually quite a recent one, which shows how black can create counterplay on the queen side and sort of show like how things can go wrong for white if we do lose control of the position. And the final game, the Pomnishi bit it, is actually from the recent 2024 candidates. If you did watch this, uh, my recaps of the candidates, you may well have seen the game, but we're going to go a little bit deeper until I've explained it. A bit more from from white's point of view here so yeah as you can see we're mixing up the the style a little bit of presentation but yeah let's get into sort of seeing these plans in action like now you know 
yeah, that white wants to play for e6, wants to, you know, play against a light squared bishop and try to, you know, create a passer on the king side. But how does that actually look in practice? Well, let's see, starting with this game between Kasparov and Kramnik. Now, you may recall that, you know, in the 2000 World Championship match between Kasparov and Kramnik, the one of the reasons that Kramnik won the match is because Kasparov just didn't win a single game in the match. You know, Kramnik just completely neutralized his white pieces with the Berlin Wall with this Berlin endgame, which at the time was, you know, not so well known as a, let's say, serious system for black. I was kidding, it's a very fringe system in 2000. But by the time this game in Astana 2001, it was a little bit more established as, you know, as a very legitimate system for black. It's like, well, if Kasparov can't break it, who can? But fittingly, it was Kasparov himself who was able to show a, a really nice idea in this game. Now, in this opening, there's kind of two main plans for black. You know, one of them is to just tuck the king away on b7 and just keep the king safe in that sort of way. Uh, often in those cases, you'll see black try to create counterplay with pushing the, the queenside pawns forward with the support of the bishop. Um, so that's the way black probably should play it. But in the game, Kramnik went for the other plan of king to e8, which maybe this is not the absolute best version of it. But of course, black is not losing by any means here either. So both sides develop their pieces pretty normally. Um, 97 might look a little bit weird, but the idea is that you are maneuvering the knight towards the g6 square, so that when the knight does go to g6, well, it might be a little bit harder for white to get in like f4, g4, f5, because now the e5 and the f4 squares are under fire. Now this true in this particular position, yeah, you could play a move like knight d4 and, you know, you're not just losing the e5 pawn, let's say. But there's still a bit of a chance of getting an f4 with their knight covering it, as it were. Uh, now in the game, I played the move knight e4, and something that you might notice here, looking at this position and kind of thinking about the, the different aspects here, is that basically all of the white pieces are kind of stuck, well not all, but like a significant percentage of them, are stuck behind this pawn on e5, where, you know, you might have even had this funny thought after Kramnik's move at knight f4, um, which is a mistake, by the way, black really should play c5 and, you know, try and get his, his bishop a bit more active. Uh, because c5 also stops moves like knight d4 and, you know, trying to support e6 that way. But after knight f4, it's kind of, you know, I'd have this funny thought that, well, if we could magically take this e-pawn off the board, well, you know, knight f6 or knight d6 is just double check and checkmate. So this might have given you the idea of the move that white should play in this position. And I appreciate that it's a move that you're not going to be able to calculate all the way to the end wherever it works, but you might have this gut feeling of, Okay, Black's king is in the center, and he's playing without the bishop and rook. So there should be something good here, right? And it turns out that e6 is that move. We're able to just rip open the, the e-file by force. Uh, they have to take with the knight, because if they take with the pawn, let's say, you know, even just bishop e5, and you know, you've got the fork on the, the knight and the pawn. Um, and since you've got c4, like, you're not even sacking a pawn, really, in, in this version. You're just basically killing Black by rather directly here. So black takes with the knight, and if you're wondering what the follow-up is, well, we play the move knight to d4. Um, and it's like it's not even like we're costing that much in a way. Like black's extra pawn is a doubled one, so it's not like the risk is that high for white. But the reward is certainly very high, where you know, like we saw, we, they can't take the knight because of the you know the checkmate, as it were. But if they can't take the knight, well then you know how are they dealing with like f4, f5 to kick the knight away, or you know for that matter in the game, like how are they? you know, dealing with the move knight f5 and just, you know, having this knight just really putting the pressure on g7. Um, in fact, it was Kasparov himself who made the point that a knight f5 is worth a pawn in terms of the attack and the initiative that you get. And probably, you know, when coaches like myself say this, these are the kind of games we automatically sort of think of. And it is true, yeah, in this position if black plays perfectly after knight d4. Yeah, they can play the move of rook h7 and, you know, they can basically survive the, uh, the attack as it were. But rook h7 is a very tough move to find. Like, it's very, very prophylactic and, you know, not the most human move, let's say. Actually, something I, I probably should have mentioned is knight d4 is not even the best move here. That actually, white should have played the move bishop to e5 first. Um, you know, threatening the, you know, the discovery in this way. And if black covers it with rook c8 to go, like, knight h4 and you know, go f4, f5. That would have been the correct way to execute the attack. But just because Kasparov didn't play it in the best way. Doesn't mean we can't learn a lot from his his game. Um, so to return to this position here, 
rook h7. You know, if you don't find the right move here as white, you know, you do need to strike when the iron is hot because you are a pawn down. So let me ask you this. What's the move that you would play in white shoes here? Also, I do want to mention, like, while you guys are, you know, thinking about it, that, you know, when you take, like, my coaching style, like, these YouTube videos, like, I kind of present them a little bit more closer to a lecture style, just because otherwise, you know, it would take, like, two hours to get for a game, and I know you guys have, like, limited time and, you know, want to, you know, get to the, the point, mean to get to the point, as it were. But in the, sort of, let's say, the private sessions or group sessions, it allows me to kind of go deeper and really focus on the things that are most relevant to you specifically as such. Um, like if you think about like the group sessions, like they're even just basically giving individual attention, but giving individual attention to many different people so that, you know, you're going to learn directly from me, but also learn from, you know, the insights I share with the other students as well in, in that respect. Like that's sort of to explain a difference. Um, but yeah, I, I digress a little bit, but this is something I'm of course very, very passionate about. And yeah, if you do need more time to solve it, you can always pause the video, but let's see the move that, that Kasparov played. He played the great move of knight of bishop to f6 here. Of course, they can't take the bishop because of the, the mate, but after the rook moves out of the way, um, there's actually a few good moves White can play where I actually really like the idea of playing a move f4 in this position. Again, realizing I'm not actually threatening to take with the, you know, the forks and so forth. But our plan is just to play knight fg3 and to just play f5 and basically just kick their knight out of the way to, you know, clear the way for the rook to effectively make the black king and it's surprisingly hard for black to deal with it like i'm not going to go deep into the analysis but it turns out that yeah this is just going to be insanely strong for for white at this point um and for the more advanced students of the position you might consider playing out in your own time against a bot around your rating to, to see if you can win it with white but in the game kasparov maybe rushed a little bit you know kind of went a little bit too forcing I mean, the good thing about bishop g7 is you do at least get your, your pawn back by force, so you're not worrying about, say, black consolidating and just being a pawn up. On the other hand, you also lose a little bit of your initiative when you cash in your chips a little bit early, uh, as it were. So, in this case, yeah, it turns out position is it's better for white, but it's not that much better for white. Because knight h1, and, you know, there is some, some actual counterplay going on here. Now, Kasparov continued to set problems for his opponent. The move king h1... Being a very nice prophylaxis, where your knight g2, rook g1 is, of course, winning a piece, but also the more subtle point is rook g2 is also not a good move because knight d3 and you know, we're able to remove the defender and, and pick up the exchange like so. Um, and of course, yeah, f2 is defended by knight as well in, in case it wasn't obvious. Um, so black goes rook to g5 instead. You know, he's not wanting to allow any rook d7 or something in the future. Knight g4, and, you know, white still has a better pawn structure here. Like, after knight h6, you know, you have a passed pawn, and black doesn't have a passed pawn yet. Rook d2, black gets a decent counterplay, and, you know, white does have to continue being a bit precise. But, of course, it's Kasparov, you know, the world number one at the time that, that we are talking about here. Even though Kramer gets through as uh, the reigning world champion there. But, yeah, you can see from the ELO, yeah, the... It was close, but Kasparov is a little bit higher rated. Um, and rook e5 is a really nice move. And the idea is actually not just to attack the pawn on uh, c5, but actually the idea is a little bit different. Like, if they play rook c2, which is a move that Kramnik should have played here, um, you can tell he was concerned about rook f5, you know, he was nervous that, you know, white would just get this really strong attack, like rook f7 and such. But it's actually not so simple. You know, black does have the option to, you know, like, unpin the, the knight to the rook. You know, if white starts taking, then, you know, black starts hoovering off all the pawns as well and you know that makes it more of a drawish kind of position as yeah the pawns all just get swapped but yeah it sort of speaks to yeah the fact that you know this is still not just a dead draw like the game does still go on here um and actually also move knight g4 could also be played where at this point like rook f1 for example would already be actually a losing mistake because black just doesn't have a good way out of the pin so black would basically be forced to sack a piece and it turns out black can survive with correct play but white's got an extra knight, so it's obviously white who's going to be playing for the win in a, in a position like this. Uh, but this is what black had to do. Um, after rook f2, the problem is now the rook f5 pin is just very, very nilsom. And if you kind of compare this sequence in the game with, you know, what uh, what we just saw, well, you know, white has this extra pawn, you know, where instead of playing rook takes a2, we have an extra tempo. 
and White used that with Rock F2 just to consolidate and just be up a piece. Um, I think I mentioned at the start, but this was actually a rapid game for those who are wondering. So yeah, Kasparov just, you know, consolidates, you know, doesn't even care about the the B3 pawn, because if they take, yeah, just H6 and you are, you know, just getting in by force, like Rook F6, take, and yeah, the H pawn is going to be a winner there. But after Rook C5, H6, yeah, there's still nothing that Black can do, just down a piece, the, you know, the pawn is at some point just going to Queen, basically, because, yeah, Black can't really stop it. And so Black resigned in, in this position. Um, so very instructive game, and, you know, I realized that, you know, most content creators will probably show you this one game and sort of wish you luck. But in my own approaches, I like to go a little bit deeper for my own understanding, because one game is not going to make you a master of something. It's going to be when you sort of repeat the key themes and, you know, have several kind of blueprints to follow that you understand that you're really going to see the results. And I think that a really important part of understanding a position is not just to only look at like the wins for your side, though it definitely is good for, for building a lot of confidence and understanding. But it's also helpful to understand what the opponent is aiming for. And this game between Prusas and the you know theoretician Lamy, who you know, is a long time second of Anish Giri, well this kind of shows what, what Black is aiming for. And you know, much like the previous game we see this old school maneuver of bring the knight to G6 so that you know if Black plays knight D4 for instance, we just take the pawn and they don't get an F4 in time. And in this position, it's true that, yeah, you nowadays will probably see more moves like King E8 and, you know, more of a, a light squared blockade. But, yeah, here White should probably go Bishop G5, just put the rooks in the center and, you know, kind of look for that right moment to play E6 or just, you know, prepare to advance the king side pawns. Um, but White played Knight E4 instead. And now after H6, we see the knight is a little bit dominated by the, the black pawns. And, you know, certainly when we play C5, we can kind of see how... It's not exactly distance four, like distance four would be if the pawn's on f6 stopping the knight from advancing. But still a very similar idea of how we're placing our pawns as a fortress to not let the white uh, pieces in so easily. Now, as John Cox pointed out in his very nice book on the Berlin Wall for Black, it's a very old book, but it still is very well explained. Um, he explained that white should play to move rook d1 and you know, kind of prompt black to play to move of king e8 here. Um, you might be wondering, well, why not just play bishop d7 and you know, just develop anyhow? Um, the reason is that actually e6 is quite a, a nuisance. You know, we kind of saw the idea in the previous game where maybe it's a little bit more obvious, but still it's kind of a good point. If you get that knight to e5, like you do actually have, you know, a, a pretty annoying pin and a, a pretty strong initiative here. And if black does play h5, well, that's a, a good square for our bishop already, uh, or for our knight for that matter. And, like, in a position like this, it's actually quite hard for, for Black to complete his development. You know, we've got the pressure down the D-file, we've got the pressure on G7, not letting the Bishman Rook get in. So Black might be a pawn up, but it's White who has all the threats and all the initiative in a, in a situation like this. Uh, which is not something that comes up in Cox's book, like, he's focused on the game from Black's point of view. But I want to share that sort of insight of when to play E6 with you guys, because his true this video is aimed a bit more at White's point of view, as it were. Uh, because you're playing the Berlin as black, like, you already find the ending fun, right? So, anyhow, c4 was played, and this is not the most precise, because in the game, black was able to bring his king to c6. And yeah, the engine will say, well, what's the big deal if the king's here or here? But still, you can kind of notice it's very hard to even come up with a sensible way to check the, the king here as, uh, as white, as it were. Uh, like, how are you even going to get the knight to a5, for example, or the knight to d8 as such? Uh, White plays move knight c3. You know, it's already a position I think that's easier for Black to play when he gets something like this. You know, if White plays a bit more quietly, say, you know, knight e1, you know, we have moves like knight f4. We just make it really hard for White to get in the f4 break, and you know, g3 is giving up the h3 pawn. So you can sort of see the the problems entailed in a you know in a position like this one, let's say, where White's majority is is actually proving rather ineffective as such, while Black does have ways to you know, create counterplay on the other side of the board. But White played knight c3, and I think that's a move you're pretty happy to see. Where, you know, even a move like a5 already and, you know, going for some some little tricks is kind of tempting. Just using the fact that the, you know, the pawns are a little bit fixed in place by White. Um, but yeah, bishop b7 was played. You know, Black went for a5 in, in this version, which, you know, it also works. It's not perfect play. You know, I think that rook d8 is ideal, but, you know, we see that Lamy does still play like the right ideas, even though it's not in the, the order the computer would use. And this was really the turning point in the game, because I think that a lot of players, like even some very strong players, don't fully understand 
the different, let's say, tenets of, of opposite colored bishop positions, you know, when there are other pieces on the board, they just think, oh, opposite colored bishops, if there are no other pieces on the board, it's just a draw. Uh, and then I think, okay, I can just play 97 and, you know, just have a, a very safe position. Uh, but that's part of the deceptive danger of the Berlin, where we see how when you have the opposite colored bishops, you know, the Botvinnik saying that you can often evaluate a position by comparing the bishops, I find is especially true for the opposite colored bishop positions. The white bishop is biting on granite, whereas the black bishop, uh, well, the black light squared bishop is able to, you know, get in there and just attack the weaknesses that, you know, are now fixed in place. So this sort of position where it would be very easy to think that you're okay, but you're actually just close to losing. So it actually is probably best for white to even sacrifice the pawn with f4 and, you know, let white take the pawn, black take the pawn, but, you know, at least you're, you know, getting that majority moving and at least you're getting some sort of play in return here. To the point where actually white's kind of doing reasonably in this case. But, yeah, in the game, white just kind of self-destructed. Like, e6 is just not so effective when you know, black's able just to lock it up with f6. And rook d1 might be a blunder, but already it's pretty hard to deal with bishop c2. Like, rook c1, rook d3, for instance, already, you know, how you're how you keeping your position together simply as, as white. Uh, you know, black can even just take this pawn on e6 whenever he pleases. So rook d1, yeah, it might be a blunder because of, you know, bishop d3, the rook being lost and, and white resigning, but, you know, white stays already kind of numbered by this stage. So we can now understand what black is aiming for in these positions and, in a sense, what we are kind of trying to avoid from white's point of view. Now, in the next game I'm going to share with you, this is going to feature a very typical endgame for the Berlin, which... It's true, you're probably not going to get this exact endgame as much nowadays. It was sort of coming up a lot more in games in the 2000s. But I also understand that, you know, if you look at kind of, let's say, the games that your where your opponents will be playing, it's often the way your opponents will play will sort of be like a sort of lagging aspect of how people played in the past. So to say, for example, if you're raid like 1600 to 1800, well, your opponents might be playing in a similar way to say how Paul Morphy's opponents were playing against him as such. Or let's say if you're playing at maybe a 2200 level or 2400 level, well, maybe your opponents are playing the way, say, the Capablanca's opponents or Bot Phoenix opponents were often playing against him. And you can sort of then use that essentially as a model of, okay, this is how I kind of like beat these opponents around this level by seeing how, you know, past great players have, have done it as such. I'm going to go a little bit off topic. I do want to share with you yeah, this, uh, this game here. Um, where, of course, in 2008, when this game was played, the H5 light squared blockade approach had not really been so developed. Uh, at that time, the idea of bishop e7 and playing to sort of trade off the knight with knight h4 was more the you know, the idea of king e8, if you would like. Um, and actually, it's sort of interesting to see, even like in the, the modern era, like the nowadays, like Stockfish really likes everyone just playing bishop e7 and like going for you know, knight h4 quite directly is, is actually a recent kind of trend. But of course, these sort of like details of the trends and the modern main lines are a better topic, you know, for a full, you know, paid course rather than for just a free training. Uh, but just letting you know about it for the, the benefit of your own research. Uh, but I played a move G4 here and, you know, we do get a somewhat similar type of position. Um, in fact, I remember that Fabiano Caruana had quite a few nice wins in, in this sort of variation. We just go like King G2, Bishop F4, F3 and just kind of steadily build up the position. But okay, in this case, white played the move rook to d1, um, which is probably not the move I would play, but I don't I don't hate it either. Um, one question, like, if they do play a move like h5 to attack our, our pawn, then what would be the way that you defend it here as white? Because this position actually, just to give a little bit of uh, an insight as to how I kind of approach chess nowadays, it's a sort of position where if you turn on the engine, it will tell you that there are two equally good moves. But if you think about it from the human point of view, there's one move that is definitely the more natural choice and the more problematic one for, for black as such. So basically here you're kind of mostly weighing up whether you want to play f3 and just keep the structure as it is, or whether you want to go g5 and try to trap their bishop in. The problem with g5 though is that f6 just allows black to, you know, free his bishop essentially. And after something like takes, like even if you just look at a a position like this, you can sort of see how the position is really opening up for the bishops. Then, you know, a natural move like gf6 is actually already a mistake. Because black can just, you know, bring the, the bishop and the king rook in. And, you know, your king safety is actually a bit of an issue, even with the, the queens off the board. Because, you know, most of the other pieces are still on the board in a sense. 
So that's kind of an example of what you're trying to avoid this white. You want to keep the structure a bit more stable when you're playing against the bishops. And that's why these sort of consolidating moves like king g2, bishop f4, like kind of fit in like in what white is trying to do. Um, you know, if they put a bishop on e6, you might play b3 and just kind of put the blot on the bishop. Which is an idea we'll sort of see in the next game between Caruana and Carlson. But yeah, just introducing like a few ideas. You know, I don't want you like to just be absorbing this material totally passively, but I want you to kind of make that mental note of the patterns and sort of apply them in your own games from there. So knight e2, you know, this is often a maneuver you'll see. Um, you, know, you might be wondering why exactly are we putting a knight on e2? Like, didn't the knight look perfectly fine on c3? But again, you know, that distance four concept comes into play once again. And what you'll kind of notice if we play out just a few more moves here, and, you know, I realize a6 is probably not the not the best move by black. Because, you know, say if we play, like, well, the Kabir wants to play kind of directly. But, like, let's say if white plays bishop a7, you'll notice that the bishop is trapped anyway up to b6. So it's like, why, you know, stop a move that they're not threatening anyway? You know, why not do something a little bit more aggressive and, you know, put a, a little pressure on the, the pawn, as it were? Uh, that's the way that black should have played it. But in the game, a6 was played. And, you know, this little inaccuracy allows white to kind of achieve his goal. Where, you know, I mentioned before that the main advantage for for black in, these, in the Berlin is basically the light squared blockade. And a light squared blockade is considerably less effective when you don't have the lights unopposed light squared bishop. I mean, it sounds like a truism, but it's, you know, it's a point worth noting. Uh, so white goes f4, and you know, I'm going to fast forward a little bit just to kind of get to the point in the game where the rooks do get traded off. Because, um, I mean, at this point, like, if black tries to keep the rooks on, you know, you do have the rook coming in, and, you know, you're really making black's life pretty miserable once you get that past pawn. Uh, but black goes rook h1, and we get this ending that... It's just a very thematic endgame, and, you know, if you've ever found that you get a bit lost when you end up in an endgame, you know, with not many pieces left on the board, or you kind of know, like, that your endgame technique is just not as good as it kind of needs to be to get to that next level, well, this is sort of where this intelligence study of different types of openings and just exploring the positions can really give you, like, ideas that you can apply not just to the Berlin endgame, but just to the endgames in general. Because this is a very technical endgame, and what we can kind of see here as well it basically comes down to, you know, can White, you know, create that second weakness, you know, right now in this position, like, you know, there's one weakness for Black in the E-Pawn, which um, I realize, you know, this might not be your normal definition of a weakness to, to some of you guys watching. Like, you might think, no, it's a double pawn to the, the weakness. But, you know, if you think about it, like, the past pawn for us is a weakness for them because they have to tie up their pieces to simply stop our pawn from queening. And yeah, in terms of the double pawns, yeah, they are a little bit vulnerable, but you'll notice that the two weaknesses are pretty close together in this position. So that doesn't absolutely guarantee, you know, that Y is just going to win the game without thinking, as it were. Now, in this position, Y played bishop f2, which I... Yeah, I think I kind of like the move of king f6, like just not giving him the chance to kind of get their king more active, but... Okay, to be fair, the nature of the position is not going to massively differ. Like, it's very, very strategic in nature here. Um, so we play out a few moves, you know, bishop a5, bishop b5, the, yeah, players go, like, shuffling a little bit. Um, also after c5, you know, if you immediately thought of the move of c4 in this position, then I'm, I'm very impressed, actually, because it means that you know about the Soviet principle, uh, just bear me a sec, you know about the Soviet principle of fixing the, the opponent's weaknesses in place, as it were. And also notice that we're fixing their pawns on the dark squares, which is really killing their bishop on b6. Um, and yeah, in this position, you know, bishop a5 in the game was admittedly a, you know, a bit of a mistake, but I think even if you play a move like c6 here, and you know, I guess you could take first, it's not going to massively change anything. But yeah, even here, like if you play, you know, bishop to, to d6, I mean, I think black's still losing anyway in this endgame, in fact. You know, kind of his mistake as far as you could see is I think when he took on f5, this actually cost him the game. Whereas if he played king f7 and kind of kept that blockade on the, the light squares, then as far as I can tell, I think that would actually allow black to save the game. Because, like, if you go f6, it looks really nice, but you just don't really have a way to break through. Like, black will just kind of shuffle the bishop around or, you know, shuffle the king back and forth, and you just, yeah, can't really find the penetration point as far as I can see. Um, so, yeah, basically, as you can see, you know, black may be able to draw this with perfect play, but it was always going to be a tough ask, you know, to defend this game passively forever. And, yeah, going back to, to this position here, like, if they play, let's say, bishop a7, well, 
we just go bishop c7 and you know their bishop is just dead so it's basically like we're playing a pawn end game with just the extra pawn so so we just win and otherwise like what else can i do i mean if they take and you know play i don't know a5 in this position you know we just can again just fix their another weakness here if they go king d8 you know we have king f6 and e7 and you know we're just putting him in this silk swan you know we already know bishop a7 bishop c7 traps the bishop but if the king moves, we just queen the pawn. So that's basically how we win in a in a position like this. And this is also why the engine will tell you know Black to just sacrifice the pawn and you know try and free himself in in this way. But even this is also going to be winning for White because we have like just enough weaknesses to get at it on the on the queen side to uh, to be able to win. Like we now have three weaknesses to target, so it's a little bit too much for Black um, in a in a position like this, for instance. Yeah, this is actually kind of an instructive point. They're able to. You know, get this position where they they just can't really stop our king getting in forever like we go bishop to d6 bishop f2 and and we just kind of maneuver around where it's eventually run out of run out of ways yeah to stop our, our king getting in um like if they play bishop g3 um yeah we can even go like just back again and you know, probably i didn't play it in the the absolute most precise way but like let's say if black does just keep trying to cover that square like what you're gonna do is you're just gonna bring the bishop to e5. That's gonna be the gonna be the key, where you know we're able to put the bishop in. You know we realize that yeah the the pawn end game is going to be a, a win for white as such. With you know the spare tempo we have to you know put black in a uh, to put black in a in a zugzwang basically like c5 and you know, we're just going to just run them out of moves that they're on the the wrong end of the the trebuchet zugzwang as such. Uh, but if they don't take, then yeah, you just go king d6, win a pawn, and you, know, you basically just win the game with the, you know, just cutting off the bishop idea that we've seen. Okay, that was a bit of a long explanation, but I think very worthwhile to, you know, understand how to convert the advantage into a win. I know it's something I've said in the past content, and I promise I would, would cover with you guys at some point. So this was a, a nice opportunity to do that. In the actual game, yeah, whites end up winning in a little bit more straightforward fashion, you know, just bringing the the king in and yeah black maybe gets e7 pawn but he's going to lose all of these guys here uh with a game in a take take king d8 bishop d6 of course pawn ending is an easy win uh keep a stretch for take and yeah we just take the second pawn and, and it's just over but the only way black can save this is if he's able to somehow like take the c pawn with the bishop and you know get the you know wrong the wrong rook's pawn kind of end game as it were but why can just avoid that very easily? Just like bishop b4, just kick the bishop off to diagonal and get the pawn moving. And you're just going to kind of repeat that process time and time again and, and win the game in that way. Um, so very, very instructive game here. Like I really love showing these sort of typical end games that just help us be better chess players as well as much better at playing the Berlin end game. Let's now see a game between Karawana against Carlsen. This was from Shamkia 2014. And this was actually the tournament, I think, believe... If I remember correctly, where Carlson achieved his highest ever live FIDE rating. So for Car Caruana to basically outplay, you know, a peak Carlson is, is of course, very, very impressive. And this H3 is kind of a recent, let's say, wrinkle. Well, maybe it's actually not that recent. It's kind of been around for, for over a decade by now. But at the time, it was a somewhat recent idea that, you know, we saw that Prusa's Lamy game with, like, this plan of, you know, the king coming to C8 and going to B7. So it was actually quite harmonious for Black. So this kind of a tree move was developed a little bit against this where you know if black does play king c8 you know you've got this extra option where you know you can go g4 and just really accelerate the advance of the of the king side pawns like this now to be fair if black plays perfectly then sure he's probably going to still have a reasonable position but at least white's kind of got you know the wind in his cells in a, in a position like this uh and also black does play move like f6 you know that's also going to to lead to some problems with you know the with his pawn on d f7 being sort of fixed as a weakness later on um like yeah even here you could just play f5 and you know, just make the point that you know our structure is very healthy and that you know the f6 pawn is fixed as a target for our unopposed dark squared bishop um so i hope that yeah you're sort of taking in these ideas like seeing how it is that we can basically advance our king side pawns without them becoming a, a weakness you know not running into something like h5 and you know just weakening our structure like that uh so yeah after h6 in the game, yeah, White played Rook D1, and, and yeah, sort of Carlson, yeah, again, goes for, like, one calling, like, the Kramnik setup with the the pieces like this. I mean, this one is a little bit of a better version, because Kaspar at least had the slightly more useful B3. You know, because when you play Rook D1, like, you are limiting their options, like, avoiding some King C8 stuff. 
But at the same time, your rook also kind of, the A rook kind of wants to go to D1. So that's why it's not absolutely the most efficient. But okay, Caruana goes for his setup. Obviously, he prepared this idea, you know, knight E4. And just, yeah, going for this very central kind of approach, just putting the, the pieces in the center. Um, also, yeah, you might have noticed that, you know, the move E6, you know, is a way to try to open things up. But in this particular version, black is going to be reasonably solid here. But it's kind of hard for you to exploit the fact that their rock on a trade is not yet in the game because they just don't have any weaknesses we can really go after um so a position like this you know would just would just basically be fine for for black essentially uh but that's the berlin you know you're, you're not going to force an advantage if they if they play correctly um mvl did play a very interesting idea against gupta it's a game that i'm not going to cover in this training it's something that if i end up writing a book on like how to play the berlin end game for white this game will definitely be in it but, you know, MBL did play this idea of, like, A4, just, like, try and accept that pawn, pawn of sorts and create some weaknesses around Black's queen side. But this idea, I think, is a little bit complex this video. Like I said, fits a lot better, I think, for, a, you know, a paid training than for, you know, sharing, like, the, the grassroots stuff here. But, yeah, knight E4, of course, is always going to be a, a healthy-looking move here. Um, up to bishop E7, white does play G4, and, you know, goes for what I kind of like to call the Caruana setup. Where you just sort of put that, the pawn on f3, just anticipating h5, you, know, you put the 94 bishop on f4. And it's a pretty easy sub to remember and kind of to, to understand. Now, black played the move of b6 here. Um, and at this point, actually, there's is another one of these positions where I think if you were to just look at it by yourself with the computer, you just see like there's a lot of different moves that white can play and you would maybe be a little bit lost in terms of how it fits together into a broader plan as such. So let me ask you this. What would be the move that you would play in white shoes at this point? Uh, what's your move with white to play? So in the game, Caruana played this move of pawn to b3. I did hint in the previous game that, you know, the idea of playing b3 and you know, trying to play against their bishop is one of white's main strategic ideas against the Berlin. And actually, when I was playing for over 100 of Maxim Vashelagrav's games in the Berlin Endgame, I noticed yeah, he was often, this was a theme in a lot of his games, is really trying to play against the, the light squared bishop in different ways. And yeah, basically, you know, if you want to play a move like, say, bishop to g3, yeah, you can definitely start with bishop g3, and, you know, you're sort of making the point that if they do take that, you know, when they lose their dark squared bishop, or when it's trade-off, that your knight can sort of play around their bishop, like you can sort of... You know, even just up a position like this where your pawns are just really constricting the, the opponent's remaining bishop. Why well, and I can sort of continue to maneuver around and, you know, hit the, the weaknesses in their position. So, yeah, that's definitely a thing as well. Like, your bishop g3 would also be a very good move. But black will probably play bishop e7. And I think that, you know, one of the benefits of Caruana's approach is you sort of keep a bit more... You give the opponent a bit more rope to hang themselves. Like, they have a much wider choice of moves here. Which, in a way, gives them more chance of making an incorrect one. And it's quite telling that even the annotator of this game actually didn't suggest the best move for black in the uh, in this case. Okay, I realize this annotation 10 years old. The engines weren't quite as strong then. But, you know, black probably should play the move king e7, which, to my mind, from like a human point of view, I think, well, I don't know if I want to play that necessarily. Because bishop g3 and, you know, I'm going to get my bishop pair traded off and, you know, my bishop looks a bit passive. No, the computer says, well, it's not so bad. Like, you can you know, play the move g6. But yeah, for a human point of view, you might be worried about that knight on coming into f6. Or, you know, you can play a move rook d5, which strikes as being a bit more natural and hitting the pawn. But then you might be wondering, well, what if white goes c4 and, you know, we go f4 and, you know, go for that e6 style pawn sack for an initiative here. Now, the point of showing you these ideas is, you know, not to, let's say, like, give what's the way to put it? Like, not to sort of, like, just drown you in variations, but to sort of show you the way that strong practical players approach these kind of situations. Like, it's not about, you know, what is the objective evaluation of the position necessarily, but it's about, like, you know, how can I ask more difficult questions of my opponent? Like, how can I make their life more difficult so they're more likely to make a mistake? And it's very instructive to see, you know, how, you know, how Carolina did this in the game, because, yeah, after C5, it's a move that, you know, it looks very natural and thematic, but after the move of c4, well, now the, the structure is fixed in place, and the more fixed structure does tend to favor the, the knight over the bishop here. Yeah, it's really weird. Like I said, I got kind of short in breath for, for some reason, because I have yeah, the, 
windows closed so my neighbors are not going to you know be tortured by the the berlin end game as well um but on a serious note let's see how the game played out so rook d7 bishop g3 you know we've kind of talked about some of these ideas already so i think you kind of get the idea um you know if black does play king d7 yeah i mean i think carlson was nervous about like f4 and you know, we can sort of see that when we're able to get this sort of pawn structure united with the pawns on f5 and e5 like that's kind of the main problem strategically facing the berlin that you've got its pawn majority but it's just very hard to move it forward because like the knight is in the way and they've got the light squared blockade so once you get an f5 like maybe you're not winning per se but it's like a just an absolute dream come true to to get a position like this one as white in the Berlin. And so black played bishop d7, I think trying to anticipate this f4, f5 a little bit. But the disadvantage is, you know, what are the squares left behind by the bishop recapture? Well, now d5 is, is not covered. So Caruana goes knight c3 to, to bring the knight in that way. And you'll notice that, like, if black does play a move like c6 to kick the knights, well, we're actually quite happy to see that, because now the, the black bishop is actually a lot more passive when you can't bring it in that way. So it's a nice example of where the, you know, the opposite culprit position is actually winning for white rather than being good for black in this case. Because, yeah, black is just, you know, completely tied up. You know, you can't even find a move for him. You know, he can shuffle back and forth, but, like, that's not really a, a recipe for survival here. Especially when you can, you know, create other weaknesses as well as white. Uh, but, yeah, in the game after rook e8, rook d1. Yeah, it's true that Carlson did make a little bit of a blunder here, which I you know, did turn into a, a nice little puzzle for my free Facebook group, Adult Chess Improvers, which I will put the link in the description below in case you want to join that and access, you know, my different free chess content there, you know, puzzles, articles, advice, and so forth. Um, but yeah, even if you play C6, like we talked about already, like how this is just such a thankless endgame to play as Black. Like even here, I think Caruana would still probably win it, even with Carlson, you know, being the best endgame player in the world. Uh, but yeah, the problem with King C8 in the game, and you know, this is one you might like to, to pause and try to figure out why the move King C8 just doesn't really work tactically, even though it's a move you want to play strategically. Um, but yeah, the answer is that the move Knight C7 is the, the clutch uh, move here. Because if they take the Knight E6s, discovering a check and hitting the Bishop at the same time. And after Rook D8, I mean, you're up a pawn, but you also just have a really dominant position. Like the Knight now is actually on an outpost on D5 without the move c6 available and now it's just a matter of technique and okay i realized that you know in an ideal world maybe i'd go a little bit deeper into you know how white you know actually wins like what the mindset is between converting the advantage but you know even just looking at the moves here i think you can sort of feel how white is really keeping a good control like the knights on the you know the dark squares to cover the light squares the the, the for the unopposed bishop we're just kind of continuing to put our piece on good squares, you know, getting the knight to have beautiful outpost on d6. Uh, like, when you know what the opponent's weaknesses are, it's much easier to come up with a good plan. And here, yeah, we notice that, you know, we're not even, you know, grabbing the pawn on f7, and, you know, allowing that counterplay of bishop h4 would be a, a little bit awkward, actually. But, no, we're focusing on keeping the control over the position, minimizing their counterplay, uh, what I like to call the Python style of play that, you know, the Soviet grandmasters often like to go for. And now f6, you know, we don't let them get their counterplay. We fix the pawn f7 as a weakness so that, you know, you can actually safely take it. Uh, now in the game, Caruana, you know, was a little bit nervous about c4 and, the, you know, and this coming in in time trouble. But the machine points out you can play the cold blood at h4 and that, you know, the fact that black doesn't have a bishop g2 or a bishop d7 mate because we cover them both does mean that we will win here, um, you know, if they try to get in, we do have like knight g5 to, you know, cut off the cut off the mating net, as it were. Uh, but in the game, yeah, Kawana was a little bit cautious. But fortunately, it didn't spoil the win for him by any means. And yeah, after knight f7, he, he saw it on the second go-around, having reached a time control. You know, already talked about how, you know, bishop g1 is you know, a close bet, but no cigar. And after rook g4, e6, yeah, the, the connected passes are just way too strong here. Um, in fact, there's a nice saying by my my past chess coach, Ian Rogers, where he would say that two connected passes on the six beat everything up to a royal flush. You know, this being, of course, uh, you know, a poker reference, you know, the royal flush being the, the very best poker hand possible. Um, but yeah, at this point, you know, we just collect the harvest, you know, without hitting the hitting a bishop as well. So that, you know, if bishop e6, we do have like, well, I was going to say knight d8 is winning a piece, but okay, rook c6 is, is arguably even simpler. 
Uh, but yeah, Bishop D4, yeah, you, you just win everything. And yeah, at this point, Black Black is losing material. And so he, he just resigned here. Um, yeah, very, very nice game by Caruana. Like even in 2100, you know, we're still going to be looking at this game as a, a model example of how to play the Berlin Endgame as white. Uh, now I want to share a couple more examples. Um, I've kind of focused a bit more on the ones I felt were the most instructive, like these last two. I'm kind of showing maybe more because they're very recent games more than, let's say, they're the absolute most instructive. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through them quite quickly and sort of give you the opportunity to kind of observe the similarities between, like, these games, these sort of modern games and sort of more older games that we, we saw. So you'll notice that kind of the opening here is very similar to what we saw in some of the others. But you'll notice that this setup is more flexible for Black and, you know, this A5 is something that Black wasn't really going for in the previous games. But you can see, like, now 94, for example, is, you know, nowhere near as effective when Black has that counterplay now on the down the A file. So White plays Rook Fe1. Um, I mean, here is White maybe the best moves Rook D3 and, like, trying to do something on the file. But I have to admit, even then, like, Black should still be doing quite fine in, in this position. Like, even something like this, you know, it's not so easy to, to break through here as White. But, you know, you can play G4, you know, you can make the argument that, you know, at least you have a, a clear plan and, you know, can, you know, definitely try to make some progress once the, you know, once that light squared bishop is out of the way. Uh, I mean, only White, I think, can realistically win. But, of course, Black objectively should be fine as well. Uh, but the game saw Rook FB1. Bishop B4, kind of a nice way just, again, to avoid Knight E4 and try to get an A4 yourself. Uh, White played a move A3, and I think this game's just really, really instructive, much like the... Versus Lemire game to kind of realize that these obstacle positions are not just fine for Black, but it's actually Black who is the one who is playing for a win here. Because let's say if you go Knight D4 and try to gain F4, you know Black is going to play G5, and you know what you're going to kind of notice if you take on E6 is that you know maybe the computer says White's still okay, but you know what's the target for the bishop? Like there's no way really this bishop can kind of go. You know if you play like Bishop D2 to go F4, like Black just covers it with Knight G6 and sort of asks. Okay, I'm just going to keep improving my position, and like, what's your, you know, what's your next idea as white? Uh, like, it's a, it's a very difficult point, I think, for the average player to appreciate. These positions are definitely not very intuitive, but just noticing like how much white's struggling to even come up with a reasonable plan, I think, is is quite telling here. Now, after king h2, you know, black plays move c5, just a nice way to kind of try to undouble the pawns if they meet a4 with b4 later. Uh, white plays a4 himself, which is a good move. But it does have the challenge that now Black has ways to try and open up the queen side and you know, either create weaknesses or even potentially create a pass pawn. And it's quite impressive, I think, that So played this move of b5, realizing that it's not such a big deal that you're sacking a pawn, because you can get it back pretty much any time anyway. But what does matter is that, you know, if they take the pawn, you're getting the rook in and you're able to target their weaknesses a lot more effectively. Um, you know, even h5 is, is a way to kind of build that, that blockade on the light squares. So they don't have counterplay on the king side like we saw in the previous games. And then the game after the move rook a1, um, for what it's worth, maybe knight d2 is, you know, just a simple move might be the best here. Just defend the pawn, but yeah, Shanklin was trying to get some active play, you know, saying that you know, if you take the pawn, you, you know, might have an e6 and you can, you know, try to activate your, your bishop in this way at least. Realizing this, you know, Wesley so just played king b6, just keeping the, keeping the control. Rook fd8, and you know, to this point, I think White's still doing more or less okay here. But he does have to maybe find some slightly tricky moves. Like, for example, here, the best move is supposedly knight d2. And using a point, I can't actually take the knight because of the, the counter fork that, that would arise with bishop c5. But it's okay. If you get the knight to e4, at least you can sort of take this pawn and you know, say that you're basically fine as White. But instead, king g3 was played. Um, and now g5 would have been a nice way just to kind of kill the, the White majority a bit. But knight g6 was played instead, h4. Um, and I have to admit, the move that So played here is really quite beautiful. And I kind of show it just to demonstrate some of the dynamic potential that Black has in, in his endgames once the queen side does open up. Because the move rook a3, it's not forced, but it's just very annoying for White to have to deal with this pin on the knight as such. You know, knight takes e5 is also a threat with the pin. So White was kind of forced to go rook e1 so that he can, you know, block it with rook e3. But even then, even this endgame here, and you know, it's not even probably perfect play by Black, but even just looking at this endgame, we can see how the extra exchange isn't really having that much value for White. Because Black has that necessary counterplay, you know, to go and just take the pawn and try to queen his e-pawn. 
and you know the position is very stable on the queen side with the bishop on on e6 covering um now white probably here should just go rook a7 and you know maybe just admit that okay in a position like this that it's you know it's just going to be basically equal in in this case like say king e2 and you know, just trying to not let them kind of get too much progress with the you know the king supporting the past c pawn now compare this to what happens in the game after e4 king b4 rook a7 um at this point actually black did kind of miss a little bit of an opportunity to go king to b3 and you know sort of get the king just cutting off the cutting off the white king like this but you know we are going to see something similar in the game come up after c6 rook b7 king c3 yeah, you can see it's kind of a similar position where black is trying to cut off the white king from reaching the pawn. Because obviously if the white king reaches d2, like white's never losing that position, realistically speaking. But, well, other than the fact that black will start taking all the pawns. So, I guess, yeah, it is actually not quite that binary. But it is to say, you know, that this position, you know, the engine gives a 0, 0, 0. But you still have to be a bit precise as white. And this position here is kind of a case in point where after the very automatic king takes g5 and c4... It turns out, unfortunately, white is just lost here because the white king is just not in time to catch the, the c pawn. If you play like king d3, they just go c2 and, you know, cut off the rook b6 check anyway with bishop b3. And yeah, g5 even just like showing off a little bit. Like, obviously, you don't want to allow, you know, the this sort of blockade. Um, Okay, it's true, you're still winning anyway because uh, the pawn will just, you know, it can't be stopped now. But yeah, at this point, white just, just resigned in, in this position. So, very nice win by, by So against Shankland, and it's kind of funny, way because Shankland actually did a course on the Berlin off a black for chess able, and he kind of, yeah, got a taste of his own medicine here, but, yeah, basically what White had to find was this move, King to E3, which looks very unintuitive, you know, like, why are we just blundering a pawn with, you know, G5 in a sense, but the point is that we're basically establishing this blockade, like, with King D4, we're able to kind of get that blockade, where we, like, blockade the C pawn, we cover the g-pawn at the same time so that when you do get a position like let's say king b3 is played and we you know get a position like uh like this one on the board for instance like you can see here like the rook is just able just to sort of shuffle back and forth and uh actually it's not quite that simple white does still have to be a bit precise but like you can put the rook on c3 and yeah now you can shuffle back and forth where you're just going to stop both those pawns and, and save the the draw in this way uh, maybe there was some better way for Black to try to push for a win in that version. But yeah, you, you get the idea of how White holds. Uh, but yeah, let's see one final game between the Pomnishi against Fitted. And this one, yeah, I realize if you've already like seen on the you know the recap of the candidates, that this will be a little bit of a repetition. So let's let's touch on it again, but you saw from the lens of the ideas that we've we've already seen in the other games. And yeah, this sort of system with H6 is, you know, it's sort of the idea of playing H6 is that say if you start with king c8 immediately you give white this option of going kind of like we saw in the you know in the a3 line on move nine where you go like knight g5 and you know in this version you can sort of make the point that knight c3 is even a more useful move than rook d1 so so this is just going to be very very nice for white and that's why he plays h6 to basically prepare the move king c8 and this sort of thing but white goes for g4 which previously was thought to be a little bit of a mistake because of the fact that black can go h5 and you know just weaken our our king side quite significantly but then this game saw nepo play to move knight to h2 saying well okay i'm just going to do a little prophylaxis against h5 and i already start to get vidit thinking just a little bit here um you know if you do play something like king c8 you can sort of see the see the difference here like that you know now this plan is not as effective because you know our pawns are just a lot faster so Black decides to adapt as well and plays a move G5, trying to cut off this F4. Uh, and it's very interesting, actually, because I think that in the past, I would have just assumed that this kind of position is just very healthy for Black. Because, like, okay, he's got the pressure on the pawn. He can try and go H5 just to split up our pawn structure even more. It's like, aren't we just creating weaknesses for, for Black to target? Uh, but it's actually not so simple. Like, White's got some, some tr trump cards here as well. Like, you can, you know, put the knight on F6 and... You know, just have a very nice outpost where you... You know, you're also fixing Black's weak pawns in a sense. So it's not, not so cut and dry. Yeah, the computer will tell you that Black is completely fine here, of course. But, you know, that was also true in the initial position. It's not really an argument against uh, against White's play here, let's say. Uh, and obviously it makes sense here that Nepo would, you know, study these sorts of positions in, in some depth in his preparation. Um, but yeah, B6 maybe not the most precise. Like, we can sort of feel... 
in a position like this, the white is starting to get a little bit of momentum, just based on the fact that the black pawns are kind of fixed in place. Uh, I mean, even a move like a4 and sort of the Maxim Michel Legrave or MVL style is kind of appealing. Maybe in the game, you know, Nepo might have felt, well, I don't really see the point if, if black just plays a5 here. But I mean, you could then play like his king g2, and I think you could argue it's a, it's a slightly better version when it's sort of a bit harder for him to kind of just grab space with the, the pawns willy-nilly. Um, and obviously, yeah, you don't really mind if they take on f6 or on f4. It kind of helps you to either improve your pawn structure or, you know, activate your, your pieces. Um, it's kind of a funny point, like how sometimes like the two knights might sometimes compete a little better against the two bishops and like a knight and a bishop. But but that's a, another story altogether. So after king g2, um, I kind of like the move knight h d5 for black, just trying to be a little bit more dynamic. But in the game... And I guess you have knight b4 as well. This is this is another little subtle point that you know the knight can can actually be a little bit of a pest here. But in the game, black played king b7. White just continued building up steadily. A5. And like I said, I think that it's better to put the pawn on a4 rather than a3. Um, you know, it might look more natural to play a3 and to sort of say like if you play c3 as in the game that this is a little bit of a ghost bishop. But it also has some drawbacks as well where now white's pawns are really fixed in place where black can go attack them. And also you also give squares like b3 to their bishop, which can make it a bit awkward for us. So not to say that white's in any problems whatsoever, it's still a balanced position, but this is why I prefer putting the pawn on a4 as white rather than letting them get their pawn on a4 as black. Um, so yeah, white plays knight h4. Um, the move h5 is a really nice move, as I talked about in the, the recap. You know, I made the point there that you know knight h5 is not going to be possible because of the tactic of take and... You know, Rook G8 and, and Black is going to, to win the knight on the next move. So that kind of forced White to play G5 and you know, now Black is you know, basically doing fine here. But then there sort of came a turning point around here where you know just at this point actually Black could have potentially been doing quite well. But he had to find this move of C4 and you know, find some some quite difficult variations that I shared in the, uh, you know, in the recap video. But for this one I'm going to focus a little more from White's point of view. Uh, because rook b3, the problem is you're just kind of trapping in your own rook a little bit. And after g6, yeah, white's able to kind of get that momentum where, once again, like what really determines, in my experience, who's going to have the better opposite colored bishop, it's going to come down to things like who has the initiative and also, like in a more locked up position, like we saw in the versus Lamy game and the Shanklin So game, the bishop for black is generally going to be better. Whereas I find in these more open positions where you've kind of got a bit of momentum on your side, it's going to be, you know, white who's going to sort of have the much better bishop. I mean, okay, probably to be fair in this case, it's more about the fact that you effectively have an extra pawn, like a pass pawn here that they don't. That's why maybe a bigger fact than the bishops themselves, but still a, an interesting point, you know, that the black bishop might have mobility, but it's a little bit stuck in this particular instance without, let's say, a pawn break to, black, to back it up. So the game went b5, white went bishop g5, knight d5. And like, notice how like you don't have to have a winning position. Like, you know, it's going to be a, you know, a long grind. Let's say to you know win the Berlin End Game, but it's also one where you know if you understand what you're doing, you know, as MVL has proved, you do have a good chance of success. Uh, might play the move Rook D1. You, know, you could also play Rook E5 as with similar ideas, but Rook to D1 was played. We had the move King C6. Again, I point out in my recap that Black should probably go Bishop E8, and but again, it's you know it's a little bit of a complicated variation to calculate. Here I'm focusing a little more on the, I guess, strategic understanding perspective than the, the move by move variations. But yeah, at this point we can see how after king e4 it's actually quite hard to, to find a square for the knight here simply. And in fact, Black's best bet would probably have been just to take and and yeah, I mean it's not really the purpose of the video like to figure out is white winning or is this a draw, but we can sort of say here that you know with the knight coming in and hitting these weaknesses, that white would have very good chances to uh to win the game in a position such as uh, such as this one, for example. Like, again, the, well, the point I'm making with this, you know, this training in general is that it's not about whether black can draw with perfect play or not, but it's about making their task as difficult as possible. Now, in the game after bishop e8, unfortunately, this does prove to be a decisive mistake, where after bishop c1, white just keeps the full control, where the rook is stuck just a little bit too long, while white is, as we see in the game, able to, to get his pawn rolling. After b4, you know, sometimes the best way to deal with threat is just to ignore it. And that is what Nepo did with king to f6. Making a point if they take our rook, we take and queen our pawn on the next move simply. Whereas in the game after bishop e8, rook d8, you know, bishop h5 and 
and Rook H8, like, you're not even just winning a piece, but you're actually, you know, just cleaning the pawn simply. But after BA5, BF3, BF3, Bishop D7, King F7, there's no good answer to Rook takes D7, followed by E8 equals Queen, and, and this is why Vidit resigned here. Um, so yeah, this is a pretty long training. You know, I kind of wasn't sure exactly how deep we'd go, but I think that, you know, with this one hour training, we're at least able to give, like, an introduction to what I was aiming for under Berlin, and, you know, you can kind of know my coaching philosophy by now, like, I like to keep things as simple as possible, but not any simpler. Well, I feel like if I'd left out any of these games, it would have left you a very incomplete understanding of the positions, but I think these six games do give you a formula you can kind of follow, you know, about needing to, like, play through, like, hundreds and hundreds of, of games, like, I kind of did that work for you and sort of you know, cherry-picked the, the very best examples for this, uh, for this training. Uh, but yeah, do let me know in the comments below, like, what was the, I guess, biggest insight you kind of got from from this training, like, about the, the Berlin Endgame, or, you know, it doesn't even have to be about the Berlin Endgame, like, it was just something that you kind of noticed is, okay, this is going to make me a better chess player in general, I'm, I'm definitely interested to hear about that in the comments as well. Um, and it also just makes you, it helps you to learn a lot more effectively and improve much more easily as well, if, you know, you're actually, like, say, sharing what you learned rather than just, you know, taking it for granted. Um, but yeah, this was a, a really fun training. Like, I really feel like even for myself, like, that these endings used to be a bit, like, I often felt very lost in these sort of endings. Like, I didn't really know what I was trying to even say as an international master. And it's just, yeah, a lot of fun to unpack these very rich positions, as it were. Um, and by the way, if you are interested in having sort of coaching with me, then I'd recommend reaching out to me. I find that job Facebook works best. Like, kind of with email, it's just sort of, most people reach out to me via email. It's sort of like, okay, like, this is my rating. Like, what's your price? And I'm personally, like, not so keen on that kind of very transactional approach. Because I think that, like, chess really... And chess, really, like, it should be fun, you know? It should be, I think, something where we really enjoy it. And where we really kind of understand, you know, this is why we are, you know, wanting to get better at chess. Rather than, you know, drink everything like a sort of, you know, like a robot in a sense. But, okay, I realize that's a personal preference. It's not a, a right or wrong thing. It's just the way that I what I'm kind of looking for in a student, basically, is, you know, feeling that kind of passion and, you know, that kind of joy and, you know, sort of being kind of excited about, you know, kind of getting better at chess. Like, that's the the kind of thing I'm sort of looking for and, you know, sort of having, you know, some, like, intelligent questions, like, not just, you know, what's your right price, but, you know, like, okay, like, how, like, what sort of way in which you can sort of help me with my chess or, you know, sort of a, I'm kind of, like, going off the top of my head, but, you know, questions like, you know, like, this is what I'm sort of looking for. Like, this is what I'm stuck with. And, like, you know, can you help with this? Or, like, how can you help me with this? Like, that's the sort of kind of, I guess, interaction I kind of like to have, you know, where we're really talking about, you know, like, you know, about chess and such. Like, that's what I, what I love most of all. And, you know, what you might love most of all as well. So, uh, anyway, that, that's my digression. And, yeah, my, my invitation. Of course, if, you know, if you're just enjoying my free content and just want to keep going through it, you know, that's totally cool of me as well. But, you know, if you do think you might be the right fit for, you know, for us to kind of work together. Definitely be interested in, you know, continuing that conversation personally. And, uh, yeah, no, no, I hope, you know, you have a, a great rest of your day. You know, I'll see you in the, the next training. Take care.